I have to tell you, and I could probably spend um, the, the next bit of time there, or the time we have remaining, going on and on and on about Jackie, Dr. Jackie Ottman, and, and why I feel so confident with her at our university under her leadership. Uh, she wouldn't like that. That wouldn't be an okay thing for me to do. But I will say that to her last set of slides, I will say that her presence on our campus together with our Indigenous faculty, Indigenous staff, and now over 3,000 Indigenous undergraduate and graduate students fills me with a sense of possibility, hope, and strength for what is ahead for the University of Saskatchewan on our continued journey, so I'm very grateful to her for that. So we're come together um, the, today and tomorrow to talk about and explore two very important paradigm shifts in Canadian higher education, indigenization and opening academia. And I don't know about others, but I've been thinking throughout the course of the day and in the lead up to the conference about the intersections between those two things. And I have no intention of trying to squish them together and come up with artificial connections, but I do invite you and encourage you to think when they come to you through the course of, of today and tomorrow about what those are. Um, so as Stryker said, my name is Patty McDougall and I serve the university as the Vice Provost of Teaching, Learning and Student Experience. I am um, born in the prairies, was born in the prairies, but really grew up in Ottawa. So um, I, I think my identity as a Canadian was much more uh, Ontario based. I have lived here in Saskatoon for over 23 years and so now I think that identity has really shifted back to, to thinking about myself as a prairie person and thinking about myself as a Saskatchewan one person, which is, was, is quite funny for someone from, from Ottawa, but really connecting with that. I'm trained as a developmental and educational psychologist, and so that's the lens through which I, I see things. Um, today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the front half, and then I'm going to invite my wonderful colleague Nancy Turner to come up and do the second half, mostly because I think it should be Nancy here when the questions come, because she knows so much more about this than I do. So that was str strategy on my part. But we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what do we mean by open educational practices and why is it important here at the University of Saskatchewan or in post-secondary education. I'm going to turn it over to Nancy, and she'll tell you about what we've been up to and uh, where we might be going next. So just to get us started, uh, at its simplest, that open cycle, as many of you will, will know, and some may not be as familiar, really at its simplest, that open cycle involves someone creating something, releasing it with an open license, and then someone else finding it and using it. So that's the cycle and how it goes around. The open release with a Creative Commons license allows for reproduction and sharing and continues that cycle. And it's important to note that that sharing doesn't mean giving away an individual's right to be given credit for that creation, nor does it mean simply posting it for free access. It is a particular type of sharing where the individual who's developed the material gives their permission through a license for their work to be used with attribution and depending on the specific type of license to be modified and then shared again with others. So what is shared in this space could be a resource or a textbook. So you hear a lot of talk and you'll hear us talk about open educational resources. Could be a course or a learning experience. People use the language of open teaching to describe those things. Could also be about open pedagogies. And there I'm talking about when students participate in the creation, sharing, and use cycle. Right? Open pedagogy. So open educational practices can involve any or all of these things, and there are numerous definitions. One that strikes me that I'd like to share, would resonated with me, comes from the International Council for Open and Distance Education. And what they have said is that open educational practices are defined as practices which support the production, use, and reuse of high quality open educational resources through institutional policies, so I want to underline that, that's the part that I gravitated to, through institutional policies which promote innovative pedagogical models and respect and empower learners as co-producers of their lifelong learning pathway. So there's an important element in here about how it is that the institution supports these open educational practices. So why 
why do we do this? Um, here at the University of Saskatchewan and certainly other places, one of the reasons, several of the reasons that, that why this is of interest to us um, or, or why we would advocate that um, we want to seek support to advance these practices has to do with improving access, has to do with enabling learning, enhancing educational practice. I'm going to go through each of those before turning it over to Nancy. I want to comment something that Corey said this morning stuck with me, something that I truly believe in as well. Um, and it's about going where the energy is and building off of those strengths. She said it in a slightly different way, slightly different context, but it's a similar sort of a meaning. So when Nancy comes up and talks to you about what we've been doing in the open textbook space, I am always reminded of you know, when, where we started off, trying to go with the largest classes, trying to get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of reducing costs, which you'll hear us talk about more, and then getting sort of barrier after barrier after barrier of why it wouldn't be possible in my own home department of psychology to get rid of the Psych 110 textbooks or et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying it was a common narrative. When we shifted gears and we had Heather Ross and her team start working on this, we went where the energy was and we started building off of those strengths. And I firmly believe that's the way to go. I also think as, as, a, as a have come to understand in the lessons of, of being someone working in administration that it's important when, when you want to influence practice, it's important that you make it easy for people, easy to do what they're called to do, and that you make it valuable. So you have to put value on those activities which you think are important to students and the institution as a whole. So why do we do this? Improving access. So um, I'm, I'm guessing that if I asked for a show of hands on how many people think that uh, textbooks, the cost of textbooks have skyrocketed beyond belief, the revision of textbooks every three years that you may have at one time used in your classroom, that everyone would put up their hand, that we got into this absolutely surreal, crazy realm. So for us, part of uh, the, the investment and the interest in this area is about improving access by decreasing those educational costs and and textbooks have the cost of textbooks many of you will know have escalated far more rapidly than things like tuition living expenses or other costs associated with post-secondary education and the challenge becomes even greater when we're talking about students who are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who will take fewer courses because of the cost of the textbooks who will go without the textbook or will have limited access to the textbook if it let's say you've got it on reserve in the library it interferes with the success of our students and so we have been motivated to decrease or remove the textbook costs wherever possible you'll hear more a bit more about that at the same time I want to be clear that that even though that has been part of what we've advanced on we acknowledge that it's sometimes not possible or even desirable depending on the situation and the resources available to get rid of a textbook we know that um, and we keep in mind that sometimes the best materials are those that are purchased and that trying to remake those materials does not make any sense at all. And we will not make the mistake of excluding good options. And we continue to understand and believe that it's our, our faculty, our instructor colleagues who are in the best position to choose the highest quality materials to, to achieve the learning goals, pursuits that they've set out. So I want to just be clear about that. We sometimes get into a little trouble, so I'll be clear. Um, so here at the University of Saskatchewan and in the province of Saskatchewan, I know I have colleagues here from other institutions, the government uh, and along with the, with the institutions have invested in the creation and adaptation of textbooks and also those very, very important ancillary resources, test banks, other learning materials, learning objects that are essential in the classroom. We have made investments into that that you'll hear about. We also think it's important to pursue because we want to enable long-term access. And so people have to sell their textbooks sometimes because they need the money, or they pay money for to access things online that disappear when the course is over. So neither of those are particularly appealing. And finally, we're invested in this because we think it's a chance to amplify voices that we want to hear more from. Uh, a key benefit that we see in open educational practice is the opportunity for people to bring the voices of those who have not 
not typically been included in commercial publication systems. And so by opening the creation and sharing of knowledge and educational experiences, we're bringing into our classrooms perspectives that are diverse and wide ranging. Some of them, if we're doing a good job, are the voices of our students themselves. Nancy will have some examples. So why do this? We want to enable learning. So one of the great things about um, open resources, open approaches, is the flexible and customizable nature of those resources as a key advantage. So I can modify an existing openly shared resources to better fit with my own style or what I want to accomplish as an instructor. I can add content, I can delete content, rework the content, and maybe most importantly, I can uh, add or modify that content so it better reflects local context. How many times have we seen a Canadianized version of a textbook, right, which adds cost, et cetera, to students? So this is a way of decreasing those costs while at the same time coming up with those local context-rich examples. I think perhaps most powerfully, the use of open resources uh, will enable our students to contribute to the modification and creation of this. And there are many examples. Often you'll see someone give an assignment in a course that involves creating content that is then shared openly with others. And in doing so, the students move from being consumers or you know, consumption of the content to becoming producers. And they're able to share it with other students and with the public. And let me also be clear that while I am certainly in favor of, of engaging students in that way, I'm not suggesting that we uh, favor practices that force students to put their content out into the public space. I think this can be done in, in respectful ways. Enable, um, enabling learning. So let me, let me just say that um, I want to highlight here um, that as, as we go through and think about this and think about the experiences that, that we've had, certainly um, the ability to develop student skills and critical thinking in, in their contributions is, is a big help. We also know that we face challenges, and many of you may have faced similar challenges when it comes to open resources or open educational practices, and that is around the topic of quality. And I won't spend um, the time, we could spend the rest of the afternoon and evening talking about quality, but it has been a big deal for us in our early conversations, and it continues to be a big deal. And I find it fascinating that when, when we relied exclusively on publishers for things like textbooks for the classroom. Somehow I think we felt that the quality question was being looked after. We didn't have to worry about quality. Someone had that under control. But now, um, now that we're looking at uh, open access and open educational practices, um, who's responsible for quality? Well, the institution is responsible for quality. The instructor is responsible for quality person who coordinates the program is responsible for quality. So none of that has shifted. Let me uh, come to an end by talking about, um, the, according to the why theme, that we want to enhance educational practices. So a powerful opportunity that open educational practice provides is, is that of opening up our teaching practices, inviting others into engaging and viewing the content that's being used and the approaches that are being taken. So that is both a powerful opportunity and also quite frightening for many people, and I don't want to dismiss that that's the case. But by inviting people in, by doing so, our faculty, our students who engage in this work, they learn. Everybody learns. They learn from those who work together in the creation. They learn about the modification of materials of others. They learn about the feedback and the engagement that occurs around those resources and the experiences that, that they choose to share with each other. And so making that teaching practice more visible and inviting others to engage uh, our work is one way in which we can develop those practices. But like many transformational experiences, there can be fear or apprehension attached to that opening of the classroom. And the, um, in the Open Educational uh, Resources Guide that's produced by the Commonwealth uh, Commonwealth of Learning and UNESCO, the authors speak about that changing role of instructor and educator that I think um, can be uh, alarming or disconcerting to some, and that includes the educator moving into the role of facilitator and manager of learning in situations where they are no longer the sole source of knowledge 
in a classroom context, be it face-to-face -face or, or other, that the educators spending considerable amount, a considerable amount of time contributing to the preparation of, of courseware, that educators are interacting with students now sometimes and more so at a distance through combinations of media, face-to-face, -face, just one possibility. All, all of that is changing and shifting the role. Being able to administer, design a system that helps to track individual students as they progress through their pathways. And, and being a member of a team as opposed to being the only person who is working on the course and being a member that is bringing expertise to the table. So there are people who find that, that intimidating and I certainly understand that. Um, let me, uh, before Nancy comes and takes over, um, let me just say that from an institutional perspective, the focus on enhancing educational practice means making strategic investments of people and money into design and development. And it turns out that the use of open licensing environments makes that investment both efficient and effective. And I'll turn it over to Nancy and she will tell you more about what we have been doing and, um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions. Thank you so much.